I'm here to see uh, Chad Stahelski's new movie, John Wick 2. I like the way he directed the first one. There's always action. Great visual. I think I would call it the 21st century action movie. I really like, you know, Chad's work from The Matrix. He knows how to choreography a shot. Looking forward to his answers about, like, the specifics and details of the production. How to maneuver between crazy action and then the real acting. How he created a movie and starring a French fire. It's just a great experience to be here. Before he directed John Wick 1, Chad Stahelski already had this remarkable 25-year career. When you think of really great action films uh, from the past few decades, Inevitably, you think about movies he worked on. Let's start with one that's, I think, reasonably well-known, The Matrix, which you cannot imagine that movie without the stunts. And for all the effects, which is really just cutting edge and still to this day so remarkably creative, it was those fight scenes that Keanu Reeves did, that his stunt double, Chad Stahelski did, uh, that really elevated that film. And he elevated countless other movies, The Wolverine, uh, the one James Mangold directed, set in Japan. He was a second unit director on The Hunger Games. He has worked on 300, V for Vendetta. So all these movies are just so driven by action he's been part of. Um, and it all served his work then as a director. When you saw John Wick, you were like, oh, that's adapted from that. No, it's not. That is an original movie. and. Within 20 minutes of watching John Wick, you realize a new franchise is born. And it's not just the action, too. The whole movie is so elegant, so assured. It's remarkable that that was his first feature as a director. And then John Wick Chapter 2. When was the last time you saw a sequel to an action movie as good as the original? This whole thing feels like the most elegant video game adaptation ever made. And yet, it's not a video game. At least not yet. But it is a franchise, and you can see why. Let's bring him out. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, the director, choreographer, stuntman, Chad Stahelski with Toba Leiter, producer. Oh, my God. Huh? <laughs> you survived. Wow. Everybody's a student, huh? All right. Stay in school. <laughs> I mean, it really was one Thanks. of the most spectacular action pictures, nonstop, the backgrounds, you know, the elegant backgrounds with the brutal action against it, you know, unbelievable. He didn't even mention half of your credit. When I, I was looking at IMDb Pro checking your credits, it's uh -huh. like every cool stunt movie, you somehow there, yeah. <laughs> you know? No so, one else is available. <laughs> I have a question for you, the Brad Pitt, Angelina Jolie, Mr. and Mr. Smith, utility stunt. What is utility stunt? That's when they can't find anybody else. <laughs> um, no, uh, stunts have a lot of different ways. You can be a stunt double, you can be a choreographer, you can be... Uh, sometimes they don't have a name for it. Sometimes you can something they call ND or nondescript. If you see a guy getting hit by a car in the background, that's an ND stunt. You see all the <laughs> army men dying? All those guys are ND stuntmen. I see. A utility stunt is somewhere that jumps from job to job. I might be a double, I might be this, or I might be one of the choreographers. I see. On that show, I was one of the choreographers. We helped train Angelina Jolie. It was a great Thanks. sequence oh, of yeah. choreography there. So let's start with how did you start in the business? I'm from Massachusetts. East Coast as well. Um, decided to go to school at USC at the time because geographically it was about the furthest place I could get into that was away from snow. <laughs> uh, at the time I was, uh, uh, I was very heavy into martial arts. Uh, my parents were athletes, so I got into it. At the time, remember this is way long ago, where martial arts weren't cool. Right. Like you didn't really get a date if you did karate. <laughs> you know, the UFC wasn't around yet and Jackie Chan wasn't known yet. And, if you knew about Bruce Lee, you really didn't go on a date. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was my kind of gig. And as I was going to school, um, I was competing, and a stunt coordinator was in the audience. He saw me compete and said, well, you might make a good stunt guy. So they had me double uh, Chris Christopherson on a, like a million-dollar movie. Chris Christopherson used to be a good... Yes, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago, and that yeah. was probably in 1990. 
and then uh, I just got into the business through them and um, I was doing a lot of TV work at the time and my boss came to me one day and I just got hit by a car so I wasn't really seeing things right. And he said, hey look, they're, they're auditioning stunt guys who have a certain skill set for this guy, Keanu Reeves, you know anything about him? I was like, ah, I don't know, I, you know. I saw him in that Bill and Ted's movie. Yeah. <laughs> so I went and auditioned and the movie ended up being The Matrix. And I passed all the auditions and then uh, I was with the Wachowskis and Yung Wu Ping, who's one of the best martial art choreographers on the planet uh, from Couching Tiger fame. Got to know Keanu and we spent the next eight years making the Matrix trilogy. And through that, um, the Wachowskis took me under their wing. Uh, most of what I know about filmmaking really came from them and they really are genius filmmakers if you look at the way they uh, compose and, and detail and create worlds. And uh, I ended up uh, directing, they gave me a camera, I was like trying to figure it out, and then I'd go shoot little things and little technically second unit things. From them, over the next eight years, I learned quite a bit from them, and then um, I had a good relationship with Warner Brothers afterwards, and they gave me a few smaller films to action direct, technically. And then it just kind of blew up from there when The Matrix came out, and it was such a success. There weren't a lot of people with our skill set as choreographers. A choreographer is just like a dance choreographer, Every time you see a martial art fight or a fight scene or wire work or even a gunfight, there's a guy like me that'll go and block it and choreograph it and hire the stuntman to do it and help the director find the interesting angles to shoot it and how the logistics are of, you know, whether it's visual effects, wire work, stunts, explosions, all that kind of stuff, and we help them put it together. So uh, after the Mesa came out, that was very much in demand. So it was like <laughs> a niche market. So. And from there, you started to direct, what, second unit? And yeah, that's second how you got unit, into if you guys directing? don't know, most action movies or most bigger movies have at least two units, sometimes three. When they call a first unit or main unit, that's your real director. A lot of the dialogue, the acting. Sometimes there's a second unit, which is technically if you're going to want an aerial shot of Rome, you send that guy, first unit never even <laughs> goes. They just do their shots. Sometimes it's like four guys and a camera in a helicopter, and that's second unit. <laughs> or a second unit can be bigger than first unit doing a big battle sequence. You know, like in the new movie Hacksaw Ridge, there's a big second unit. You know, all the big establishing shots are probably second unit, or Braveheart with all the horses, anything that doesn't have your lead cast in it. Then you have like an action unit that may or may not have lead cast in it and do big sequences. And then you may even have a third or a fourth unit with visual effects that are shooting all your blue screen elements or the, the digital composer modeling or anything like that, like in the original Star Wars or anything. So we got very good at crossing the line and all the other directing work. And uh, we've been trying to direct, my partner and I, uh, for a couple years, but we just, we got, I think, let's see, like every Navy SEAL ninja <laughs> assassin script out there, and they're really bad. <laughs> uh, I've certainly seen probably most of them that were made. Uh, no, they were really bad scripts. And then uh, Keanu, who I hadn't talked to in a while, called up one day and said, hey, I got this script, would you want to read it? And I read it and John Wick was, let's see, he was 65 years old, his dog was a German Shepherd, his wife died when she was 50, and it all took place in New Jersey. Oh, and man. It wasn't, nothing against New Jersey, it just wasn't very sexy. Yes. <laughs> so I was a big fan of, uh, when I was in college, I was a big fan of mythology, Greek mythology and stuff. So we said, well, why don't we just remodel this to be a Greek myth? That's why we did it. If you go back and watch the first John Wick, you'll see all the, there's a lot of mythological references in it. The underworld, Sharon, the river Styx, all this kind of stuff. So we just painted it over and made it a mythical world. After spending 10 years with the Wachowskis, you, nothing else, you know how to world build. <laughs> so we kind of went into that and our action background gave us like, look, when you don't have, I don't know if you guys know about budgeting, but the first John Wick was made for about 18 million bucks. That sounds like a big chunk if you're gonna buy a new car, but for making a movie, <laughs> it's not very much money. Um, so we had to come up with ways to do things very cheap, especially when you shoot in New York. So when we do the longer takes and stuff like that, we just literally um, told Keanu, yeah, like you, right. the more coverage you do, the longer it takes. That's why you see all the editing. So we're like, look, we wanna do something cool. We'll do like, we'll, we'll go back with Jackie Chan and all that stuff, and we'll do longer takes, less editing. But the payback is like, you know, Keanu's got to spend three months in the gym learning all this stuff. Because right. at the time he was 50 years old. I don't know if you guys, most people can't walk when they're 50, <laughs> let alone do, do, do jujitsu. So we beat the shit out of him for about three months. We have a facility here in town that trains cast. That's where we, we train all the Marvel people, the DC superheroes and all that stuff. So we got Keanu in there with the best tactical gun people, jujitsu guys and stunt guys, and just he literally lived there. And that's how we. Uh, and you were his stunt that's double. That's where I'm so, going to move into. Right. <laughs> I was a stunt double. And you were a stunt double, so all of a sudden, like instead of being his stunt double, you're directing. So it's basically like, hey, Keanu, sorry, buddy. Yeah, this I'm one's old on now. you. 
Yeah, that was when I was younger. <laughs> He's got a very good stunt double now, one of our guys. That's mm -hmm. a lot younger than I am. Could you talk a little bit about, uh, you were second unit director on uh, Civil War, mm -hmm. uh, right? Could you talk a little bit about what work you did as second unit director um, for a film that's that? Sure, we, we have a very, most directors don't jump back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, my partner, Dave Leach, I, Dave's directing the new Deadpool right. as well. He was my co-director mm -hmm. on Jumwick. And um, Atomic Blonde, is that Yeah, uh, Charlize well? Theron's we have a Risen yeah. Call Cold the City is coming out um, in July, I think. Mm -hmm. is what the release date is. Um, we have a company called 8711. We're a one-of-a-kind company that pretty much, we call it, it's action design. You can hand us a script, or you hand us a sequence, and we write it, and we design it, and we bring it to fruition. Rather than just writing something that can't be achieved, or can be achieved for an extra $100 million, we work with the producers, the directors, and everything, and actually build an action sequence. And hopefully employing, just like, you know, a couple years ago, the X Games were new, snowboarding was new, the MMA was new. Now you cut to what's new tomorrow, not what mm -hmm. they're trying to do today. So yeah. studios will come to us a lot and have us design a new sequence. So the Russos are kind of friends of ours from the commercial days. Mm -hmm. People that we had known and really, really dug. And they had just saw John Wick and they were like, oh my God, can you help us with Spider-Man? And we're like, yeah, sure, that'd be great. <laughs> So we helped design the, the Captain America and Bucky stuff in Civil War, and we helped design the airport sequence, and that's the sequence we shot, the and, airport and sequence I, with all the, right. the actual Civil War part. And the staircase scene, uh, which if you guys remember Civil War, that scene, I mean, it, it feels like that could yeah. have actually been a John Wick. Yeah, same guys. Um, yeah, so no, it's fun. Part of, I think, why we got such the education we did or the background we did is you're coming up, you work with Wachowski, you work with Fincher, we did Zack Snyder, we did um, worked a lot with um, Guy Ritchie, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, just that alone is, you know, on the second unit jobs, I got to direct Robert De Niro, I got to do Hugh Jackman, right. I got to do Tom Hardy, I got, like, you know, these are just, so by the time you go to film school like that, you've directed, you've worked with lead cast, you've worked with some of the best directors on the planet, if you pay attention, not just to, you know, where to put the camera, but how to run the business, how to budget, and how to spend the money they give you, mm -hmm. you can be fairly efficient, and that's kind of the best film school you could ever go to, sure. you know, so very fortunate. So, um, how much do directors in general know about stunt work? And if they don't, is there a way to explain it to them? Or you just go and say, trust me, or they say... <laughs> um, you gotta remember where directors come from. Um, you know, back in, the, back in the day, they could have been artists or photographers or poets or writers or novelists. Like, it, it, they're very well versed in a, in a broad sense of education. Now you can have a music video director, you can have uh, any one of you right out of film school, you know, you do a cool project, somebody sees, oh, he's got a little bit of shine, and they'll give you a $15 million movie, <laughs> okay? Um, and there's guys that come from production design that are directors, uh, stunt guy, uh, you know, visual effects supervisors, so you don't really know. If, if they've come from an onset or in the trenches background, they probably have an inkling of at least what a good stunt or bad stunt is or what an action design may look like. Mm -hmm. Most of the, the problems with action design is tone. Like what kind of, most directors don't know tone. That's where most of the, the cleanup jobs we have to go in and fix are our tone. It's like, that's why sometimes you watch a movie and it'll be kind of funny, kind of weird, kind of serious, kind of, because <laughs> right. the guy's kind of gay, he's all over the place. He's like, well, you know, we always want in, so okay, so what do you want out of your movie? And they'll go, well, you know that scene in Captain America, we're gonna do that, but then we're gonna do Born. But then we want the scene where it's like, you know, American History X, and then, but it's a little Buster Keaton. And I'm like, wow, that's a hell of a movie, dude. Um, so if you don't know what your movie is, you're gonna have a problem, sure. you know, totally through the action as well. Like, um, like you brought up earlier, like John Wick, it is brutal, it is violent, just because of the way we chose to shoot it, because it's, it's connective. It's not like the typical gunfight where you, you do a single on the guy shooting and you reverse and you see the right. guy falling down. It is connected, and in order to do that, that's in close proximity. Intimacy always brings more emotional content to it, but that kind of ties into what tone is, and yes. that's what you have to explain. Right. So if you can get that, but back to your question, different directors come from different backgrounds. Some are very versed, some are not. The best thing I can say to anybody here that wants to be a director is, it should never be the way it is kind of in Hollywood today. That's kind of the biggest thing. I shouldn't say that's why I have so many houses right now. Um, <laughs> I don't I only have one, but it's really big. Um, it's mostly because they come in and they think, oh, well, Chad's the action guy, or Bob's the action guy, or Scott's the action. So I'm just gonna go eat lunch. That's the worst attitude you can have. How many movies have you recently watched where it just becomes a gunfighter, just becomes a fight scene, and it's the obligatory third act, I gotta beat up the giant robot? 
but you don't really feel anything. You don't care. You don't really see the actor's face because he's in a suit, a hood, or a mask. That's because it wasn't shot by the director. That's because the cast wasn't even on set. That was the second unit guys trying to get it done with what first unit gave them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you know, Bob, the action star, has already gone home or is in his house in the Bahamas and <laughs> we're trying to finish the movie. <laughs> um, it's become this thing where action has been divided, where storytelling stops. And then we're supposed to just go in and do an action scene because the studio wants an action scene. Like at what point, like take your godfather or anything like that, De Niro was in that scene, <laughs> you know what I mean? Scorsese shot it, you know what I mean? Like they kept it in, storytelling was just part of the action. The reason we did what we did on John Wick was not just to you know, show off and say look at our guy. The reason is like, how many of you guys have seen in action movies the scene with the two FBI guys, the CIA guys, open the folder and go, Joe, he was the Navy SEALs, he was the three tours, in like he'd tell you how badass he is. But do you ever see him do anything badass? <laughs> <laughs> not really, we figured, Let's not do that scene. And John's gonna cry over a puppy. He's gonna lay down in his boxer shorts. He's gonna be mopey. And then when he picks up a gun, then you get to see him. And you don't have to ask whether he's badass. And you don't have to worry about the editing. You don't have to worry about the VFX. You're actually seeing who? Keanu Reeves do something that you think is kind of difficult, right? There's no cuts. It's him doing it all. Wow. How many of you have seen Jackie Chan movies? Y'all love Jackie Chan, right? Yeah. Jackie's mm -hmm. awesome. Great guy. Okay, give me the name of his character in any movie. Drunken Master. And okay, maybe get a Lee. Most of the time it's just Jackie, right? <laughs> Do you care? John Wayne. <laughs> yeah, John Wayne. <laughs> but you really don't care, because why? It's Jackie. You're going to see Jackie. You don't care the characters. You don't care what the plot is. You want to see Jackie. And why do you love him so much? You don't love the back of his head, right? You don't love the super wide top shot? You love Jackie, because you know that's the guy that fell off that fucking clock tower, right? <laughs> right? That's why you believe it. So there's believability in the character. When you see a character in mode, it's the same thing. When you really see Christian Bale cry, that's really Christian Bale crying. Like, you, you, you get on board with that. What if you just saw the back of his head crying? You don't really care, right? <laughs> it sounds silly, but that's what you're doing with action. If you see the guy doing his own action, that's great. Like, stunt doubles are great. Don't get me wrong. Made a great job out of it. You get some point, not everybody can do the splits. Just, well, some of us got to go in and do the splits. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Not everybody wants to get hit by a bus. Okay? <laughs> some of us are dumb enough to go and get hit by a bus. Okay? For a lot of money. Um, actually, not as much as you'd think. Um, but that's just kind of what you do. So when you go into a director where they know not the best ones, they may not know anything about stunts. The Wachowskis didn't know. There are two kids from Chicago that used to draw comic books, and that's how mm -hmm. they got into the business. They just wrote comic books. But as soon as they know they always loved watching kung fu, they went to China, got hooked up with Yung Wu Ping, the best right. kung fu crowd on the planet. They went to the hooked source. Up with, they went to the source and yeah. for two years educated themselves and wrote The Matrix. Wow. So when they came to us, they could, th they could name every move with the Cantonese name in that first fight scene in the dojo. Mm -hmm. You know, and they burn in there in every rehearsal. They were, they were in live, in rehearsals with an actor. I don't know if you guys have ever seen an Air 3 It's a big ass camera that weighs about 85 pounds. <laughs> they'd put on the shoulders just to find the angles and figure out what is possible. So they'd get those great angles in the Matrix. Like they gave a shit. They knew action is a huge part of what the Matrix is. Mm -hmm. Imagine Matrix with shitty fight scenes. All right, it's not the same movie, right? It wouldn't blow your doors off. They did it. They knew that, why, why is Jackie Chan? Well, it's a simple, because it's Jackie. They're like, okay, well, we got to get Jackie Chan. We're just going to call him Keanu Reeves. <laughs> and Carrie Ann Moss, and they're all, that was in the contract. It's like, you're going to give us six months of your life in a right. gym, and then we're going to go do this movie. But we ain't going to pay you. <laughs> but it's going to be a great movie. Right. <laughs> and that takes a lot from a cast member to do. So kudos to Keanu and the rest of the cast. But th that's, that's directing. Sure. If you're going to do a movie about you know, horse racing, learn about horse racing. You're going to do a movie about boxing, learn about boxing. Don't divide it up. Storytelling right. is storytelling. And one thing I feel like both John Wick, John Wick 2, but then also a lot of the movies you've worked on in the past, a lot of this action you've directed and, and performed in, I feel like there's such a great clarity in this. Like, I don't know, how, one thing that drives me nuts as an audience member is you watch an action scene and you have no idea what's going on. And I don't want to make fun of Transformers, mm -hmm. but I'm going to make fun of Transformers <laughs> because I have no idea what I'm looking at when I see that film. I consider myself relatively intelligent. But this, I feel like we always understood spatially, sure. sort of the choreography. I mean, I feel like that is such a wonderful skill it's, that um, you've brought to your films. Yeah, I was sometimes Again, I, at the edge of my seat, yeah, really, yeah, yeah. and kind of nervous. Thanks. It's a directing style. It's, it's not really us. We copied stuff from the 70s. 
60s and 70s and obviously you know we have a huge influence with um, Sergio Leone, Bernardo Bertolucci, Andrei Tchaikovsky, um, all framing and composition you probably recognize in there. The Wachowskis are obviously huge. Um, but you gotta remember why editing exists. Mm -hmm. It controls pacing and like uh, framing why does it exist. Um, I believe in choice more than anything. And when I was a second unit director, work, say I was working for you, I would try to design a sequence and help design it so that you had choices. Mm -hmm. Meaning I'm trying to get the actor to do as much as you can in an environment like any of us can walk into this room. Do you want to see depth or do you want to look into an exit scene? Okay, well that's kind of an uglier background. That's kind of cool with all you guys, but now I got to fill it with exit. Like, so you try to give the director choices about how to spin the choreography, how to make the guys move. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that editing should be a creative choice. I believe framing and shots should be a creative choice. Most things are done today, unfortunately. Like, let's look back at uh, Paul Greengrass, Second Born. Okay, when we first really brought back Shaky Cam. When I was coming up, Shaky Cam was just called bad camera work. <laughs> <laughs> and you got fired for it. <laughs> and now it's back, so it's, they don't even try. <laughs> you can just do this. You had to call, it was like, pool. you had to call your shot back in the day. Now you just swirl around with five cameras. Um, but Paul did it for a very interesting reason. Listen, talk about it. He did it because he wanted Bourne, the character of Bourne, to feel frantic and phonetic and disorientated. Right. That's why he did it. And if you go back and watch the second board, it's not super kooky. It's just kinetic. Right. And you get that. He put the pulse in it. He wanted to infuse pace in something. That right. It's still really very happen. clear, though, when you it's watch still, it. It is. And totally. that's what I could try. I think that's a great use of handheld. That's a great use of more ballistic editing, even when you're crossing the line and, and doing things like that. Um, unfortunately, that's become a time saving technique. Uh, I'm sure you guys know time is money in the film industry. You have a 12 hour day. Some directors average three setups a day, some can get as many as 50. You're judged by your setup. Setups mean coverage. Coverage means you have to time man time management is probably the best logistical skill a director can have because you know you don't want to spend two hours shooting this guy's close up and then 20 minutes on your close up when it's you know Brad Pitt you might you're gonna get yelled at for that. But when you go through it, it's like you know it's become a way to hide instead of a way to show. Like, like a bandage. You're yeah. like if you want to put a big 10 millimeter down here and I want to see the room, I want to see all of you. Okay, and say each one of you is 300 bucks a pop for a background player, but I got four dollars. All right, now I have to digitally put like, okay, so maybe I'm going to lift it up top shot and just you, or I'm going to shoot through these. Now I'm trying to hide what I don't have, which is fine. It's a very intelligent way to, to make movies for a budget, but when everything becomes, well, you're hiding to hide a stunt double. So you guys know if you stunt you, over the shoulders, are usually doubles or anything like that. Or a big top shot, that's usually a double. <laughs> if you're shooting through fire, it's probably a double. <laughs> or if the superhero's got a mask, that's a stunt double. Um, I'm giving away all these things. Um, so say, okay, now I got a stunt double, I got to hide the wires. The actor only knows three moves on the other side. Okay, you know how you have your two stunt doubles, so you can't, like, which side do you, well, you don't. You got to shoot a top or something so wide you can't tell what's going on. So you need at least one actor in there. Right. Right? So now you're later with the show, but say the guy's a lefty and he's got the sword in his right hand and no one thought to train him in the right hand and he trained for about six hours and he's supposed to be El Cid. You know, like that's not going to go well. <laughs> so they're going to get two hand inserts to click in like this. <laughs> so where do you think, before you've even stepped on set and broken out a camera, where's that sequence gone? How much choice do I really have as a director? Now I'm solving a problem. I'm not shooting creative, I'm solving problems. I get to set, I haven't rehearsed. I haven't seen the location before. The, because I didn't pay attention in the design phase of the set, they put the ceiling at about six feet. Well, my actors are seven feet tall. <laughs> Swords, I don't know if you've seen a sword before, but it's a three feet of steel. So I can't uh, stab the ceiling. <laughs> so now I'm kneeling down trying to cheat. Like, again, it becomes more about problem solving and hiding issues. Right. I gotta cut fast because I don't have more than three moves in a fight scene. You know, I didn't get the good guns, so I, I got guns with blanks, and I don't know if you've ever seen a real blank fire. It's about 15 feet minimal without hurting somebody on a regular blank. What you saw there, those are all digital muzzle flashes. There's something called the plug gun where nothing can come out of the barrel, so it's a new kind of invention in Hollywood right now. Um, but without tools and proper prep, like you have to make decisions three, four months out before you roll the camera, before you even step on set. If you do that and carry your path through and get everybody involved, if I don't tell my DP, my cinematographer, <laughs> that I'm gonna shoot wide and do one long shot through catacombs, like we're, you understand, like the wider the shot, the more pissed off your cinematographer gets because he's <laughs> got to get the lighting in there. Okay, so what happened? So he's trying to make a pretty picture, but you need to see a big sword fight. He didn't know. He didn't tell him until like the day before. So he's freaking out. He doesn't mm -hmm. know how to light it. That's why you see so many lights in our shots. 
We just made them part of the set. We're like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> you know? But it was part of the plan. And now we have an actor that's trained for six months. Now we're not just an actor. We have all our actors trained. So I don't have to do overs. I can do profiles. And I can see both. You can see Common and Keanu doing this thing, or Ruby Rose and Keanu doing this thing. If you make those decisions early and you plan it and you get everybody, your cinematographer, your wardrobe, OK, wardrobe. OK, we're going to have to cut gussets in the pants. When they squat down, they don't tear the crotch out. You know I mean? You know, we got to get tattoos that don't rub off with sweat. Right. You know? If you plan that all the way through, you can get better action. It's just like planning any other sequence. That's your mise en scène. That's your, that's your plan. If you have a plan, you make a commitment to that plan and get your crew. Because remember, how many of you can sing, dance, or a musician? Paint, anything? Arti that's a singular artistic endeavor, right? Feels good. I, I'm so jealous of you all. I wish I could pick up a brush or pick up a microphone or pick up an instrument and just play. Then it goes from me to you. You know how many people minimal you have between me and that movie? Uh -huh. I'm being really conservative, about 500. About 100 of them can make a direct impact on them. And I'm not even counting the studio. I'm not even counting the money people who can just, at a whim, go, it's our money. We're going to have them in blue. Okay? I'm talking the entire cast has an effect on my movie. The DP has an effect. My editor has an effect. The VFX, what if my VFX guy doesn't budget right and I'm short and all, it's all the blood shitty? It looks like jelly or something. <laughs> you're going to laugh at my movie. You're not supposed to laugh at that right. point. You know, so I have to be a communicator. I have to somehow get everybody on board with me how I'm going to make this thing. And that's only done through just, you got to bash them over the head with everything you can, with passion, with endeavor, with photos, with you know, inflection, with rehearsals. You got to walk them through locations. You got to get it. You got to communicate your vision to get there. And that's where so many other, I think, directors or projects have issues, mm -hmm. is they don't understand that from the beginning. So by the time they'll bring in a stunt corner or somebody like that, you're already knee deep in it. Decisions have already, sets have already been built, actors have already been cast, deals have already been made. And you know, if you got Brad Pitt that's making twenty million a picture, he's got to make three pictures a year because he's supporting nineteen houses. <laughs> you can't go in and go, okay, well you're gonna do, you're gonna be the best, you're gonna be the best. I don't know, I'll say Robin Hood of all time. You're gonna be the best <laughs> sword fight archery guy. But we need three months of your time. He's like, three months, three months. I can make another twenty million dollars. There's no way I'm doing <laughs> Like the business of Hollywood does affect it, and you have to know that because that will affect your movie and your action. Mm -hmm. If you're clever with all these things and you're solving problems as you go, you can usually get what you want. You know, if you want to bake a chocolate chip cookie, you got to go get the chocolate chips. It's hard to get done all the way in. You bake the cookie and go, ah, fuck, I forgot the chocolate chips. And then bitch about why you didn't get the chocolate chips. You know, you kind of, <laughs> kind of got to plan it. I, sorry, I got more of a layman's term of directing. But now we know how to make chocolate chip cookies, too. <laughs> we should open up yep. for the students. Hi. Hi. Hey, my name is Maurice. Hi. My question is quite long. So, uh, what's the most challenging part when directing a film that's heavily filled with stunts? And which scene was the most difficult to film in? Let's go in reverse. Uh, the mirror room, just logistically. And I only mean that because uh, no one knew what the hell I was talking about when I pitched it. <laughs> I'm a huge uh, Bruce Lee Shanghai? fan, so that was my tribute to Ender the Dragon. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to do it like that. Oh, uh, I thought it was Lady easier. from Shanghai. Which is where Robert Klaus stole it in the first place. Uh, who originally stole it from, again, Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, onto Lady from Shanghai lent it to that director, and Klaus <laughs> stole it for Enter the Dragon. So I'm in a long line of thieves. Um, just want to do something different. Um, remember, something like that doesn't material, like that location doesn't exist. We built that. That's one of the few builds in the movie. So when you get that, you have to think, one, what is the cost? What is the, just you have to think of that one three months before you even show up on set. And you got to start designing it. Now, no one's ever built a mirror room before for a gunfight that I could find. So you're like, OK. Uh, so me and the stunt team went out and bought a bunch of these really cheap dance mirrors, about 50 of them, and lined a room about this big with them and started creeping around with a little toy gun on weekends with our iPhones and trying to figure out, OK, you see the guy there, I don't see. Then we figured out we had to rotate the mirrors. And they rotate not just for fun, but 50% of what you don't see is because I can angle the mirrors or I'm hiding camera teams behind mirrors. So it took literally three months to figure out. And at the same time, I have to build the set. The first budget came back at about 1.2 million to build that set. So we had to shrink it down and shrink it down and figure like that's why it's not real glass in every shot. Sometimes it's lanthane, it's a uh, reflective material, not real glass. So when you shoot it it doesn't shatter, which is another handy thing to know. <laughs> um, so we get it down to about 700,000 and that's just to build the thing. But you can't build it all in one day. You build a small section of it, you test it going I think this is going to work. Then they build another piece or you have to tear it down and rebuild it as you go. And then now you're in there, now where do I hide a 50-person crew, five stunt guys, and still get my camera out? Okay, well that goes to VFX. 
you know, the original budget came back, well, it's going to be 800 to a million dollars to remove everything. And you're like, wow. whoa, hey, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that's a much. So you got to figure out, okay, well, screw it. We'll have to figure out how to do it practically. And then it's back to the, with the stunt guys and little mirrors and your iPhones thinking, well, if the mirror moves, if I do this, if I put the camera guy low and shoot Keanu up high, it'll hide. So it's just a lot of rolling up your sleeves and figuring it out and knowing what you spend. We're still trying to look cool. That's why we put mirrors on the ceiling, trying to be inventive. Otherwise, that could have got really boring, too. You know? And what was your other question? Um, the other question, how does, um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the most challenging part when directing a film that's heavily filled with, like, stunts? Like, it, it's pretty much, it's kind of what, what I just talked about. Um, again, you'll find out very, like, you can be the mad, kooky director and go, Jesus Christ, don't you understand what I'm saying? And like the guys, we've looked at, so, I've looked at so many directors and literally said, no, I have no fucking idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> because all you're doing is pulling your hair out and shaking your hands. I, I don't read minds. <laughs> I'm good, I'm just not that good. So, like, it, uh, everybody's seen a tree. Everybody draw a picture of a tree. I guarantee you no two pictures will come alike. And that's the thing. So I think the best skill is the same, is the also part of the biggest problem in directing. It's like, I have to get what's in my head. Like I'm a control freak, just like most directors. And I eatist, just like most directors. Okay, I wanna control everything, but you can do that one of two ways. Okay, technically three. Okay, you can just give up and just yeah, I don't know what I want. So just show me what you got and I'll take the best idea. I think that's the shittiest of the three. You can be the, the mad scientist guy going, just yelling and screaming and yelling and screaming to you batter people down. I just found that that's only 50-50. You know, you get maybe 50% of what you want. And then there's like, okay guys, basically I have to take it in my job. My first three months of prep is education. I need to put together a crew that is close to my vision. Then I gotta pound them and show them and lovingly hug and embrace them and bring them into my world. I gotta get them to think. I, I'm working on the script for Highlander right now. So we watched the original, we go, oh, no, what do we love of the original? Then I give everybody in my writing team, I give them like Joseph Campbell books. <laughs> <Make them> <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, I'm, they read Nietzsche. We're all in the same, by the sword, with all these Buddhist philosophy things on Japanese swordsmanship. Like I chalk them full of everything that's inspired me, from pictures to landscape to video. I, I make them play uh, Scottish Gaelic music, okay, when they're writing. Just I want them in the world I want to be. I want to immerse them in the world. Just like with John, we immerse you in the world. I made everybody go to gun school. My sound department, I think just for fun, just for a bonding thing, I took them all up to the gun range where we trained piano. So they're all shooting guns, going, oh my God, and they get it, and they open every set. And so when they come, they're excited, we're making it something different. They got to see it. And if you can communicate that and get your crew on board and get your cast on board, now I've got 50 people trying to work for the same division. Otherwise, it's chasing cats. Mm. <laughs> it's like, I, what did you not get about I don't like bright pink neon? I don't, and then the guy, like, you got to get them on the same page. So I think being able to communicate your vision is the biggest problem, but yet the biggest skill and challenge with the director. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. All right, so Chad, being a veteran stuntman, now turned director, I want to ask, is there any possibility of becoming an AD, sorry, was it ND stuntman? Hmm? Sorry, was it ND stuntman? Nondescript is yeah. uh, what they is call it, it a nondescript background, just the industry term is just ND. Yeah. Is it possible to become an ND stuntman and direct movies like at the same time? Is it possible to uh, juggle yes, if both? I can career? do both at the same time. I'm too old, dude. No, sorry. Is it possible <laughs> is it possible for someone to a like, career juggle, path, you mean? to juggle both careers Honestly, at the same time? I, and this is again the industry is always changing. Like you guys probably know more about what it's like than I did at the in the day. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just to give a little bit of, like, I have seen stuff in this business that's phenomenal, like true Hollywood stories. Um, you know, if you listen to, like, Hugh Jackman, or you listen to Statham, or you listen to, like, I, you know, I've done three movies with Stallone, and just to hear, I mean, he was a hairdresser. Like, I'm talking, like, a legitimate, full-blown hairdresser on set as he was writing... Um, oh, Lords of Flatbush? Lords yes. of Flatbush. Yeah. Um, you know, there, it, it's whatever you do. If you want to make movies, you guys have this rare technological advantage that we didn't have. Like right now, any one of you can pick up an iPhone and go make a movie. Like there's no, like you can edit that, you can learn to edit, you can learn simple concepts of editing right now. You can learn simple concepts of music design. Like you guys can, what, SoundForge, I don't even know what, <laughs> iTunes, you guys can do it. You can make a movie on your iPhone, which is, we had to go out and like save every penny we could to get this big VHS camera and then VCR to VCR. You guys know what a VCR is? Yes. Okay, <laughs> VCR to VCR. <laughs> so the answer to your question is absolutely just, it's very easy, you get into stunts. Like, uh, anybody knows what the, good thing to know for all you guys too is part of it is like just know what people make. 
that helps you, like, never underestimate the power of controlling the money. Okay, it's not like that should be your only job, but you should know what things cost. You should know what people cost, you know what time costs, you know what cameras cost, it helps. A stunt guy right now is about 800 bucks a day for the first eight hours, then he goes into overtime, unless you're on a weekly, then he's about $3,700. Okay, it's not a bad job, okay? If for just getting hit by cars or shot, right? Mm -hmm. It's a good job. It's easy to get in, say you're a 21-year-old kid, you just graduated, you know, now you're making anywhere from three to five a week. That's pretty, you can live pretty well, you can get a new car, you can get a nice apartment, you can do it, you, and you get suckered into that easy life, and you don't do your homework. Like, you still gotta look through those lenses, you still gotta find out what a gaffer does, you still gotta learn about lighting, you still gotta, you know, I'm a avid photographer, I live and breathe with a lens. That's what I do all day long, wherever I go. Um, I live and breathe with a lot of writers right now, just because I wanna hear stories, I wanna hear how people tell stories. If you're willing to do the work and be a storyteller, yes, obviously, make money, be on set, do your thing, and at the same time, learn how to tell, like, you, sh you can go both in parallel, you don't have to do one than the other. You know, be the stunt guy. You know, you're young. You, know, you want to get hit by cars, you want to do fight scenes, you want to live the life and be Hooper, right on. <laughs> At the same time, you know, don't give, like right now, you never know. You could talk to the right person, you do that little short film, and bang, you're in. You know? Awesome. So the answer yep. is, yeah, man, go for it. Cool. Thank you. Don't land on your head, though. Great. <laughs> Hi, my name is Brianna. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, as a director, how involved are you with the stunts, and what is your collaboration like with the stunt choreographer? Uh, most of it, I'm one of the choreographers. Um, there, there are two or three other stunt guys that have become directors who's kind of, they weren't choreographers, and they kind of let other people do the stunt. I am, again, an incredible uh, egotistical control freak. Um, most of the choreography you see is something I've either performed or put together. I still coach. I still teach martial arts to, to stunt people pretty much every morning. Um, it's what I enjoy. It's what I do. I have a facility by LAX that we train some of the best stunt guys around. Um, I think I have, it's probably, I'm probably better at that than I'm at directing to tell you the truth. So I kind of stay involved because it, that helps me create, if that makes any sense to you. You know, um, when I choreograph, I'm trying to picture what the character, the, any, any good action sequence has moments. Like, you guys have all seen the first Matrix. You probably can't tell me three kung fu moves. Bong sao, hyun sao, kun sao, kung sao, you know, okay, the round out, spinning hook kick. But you can tell me Carrie Ann walking on the wall and doing the eagle thing. You can tell me Keanu leaning back in the bullet time, right? Mm -hmm. You can give me moments. You can give me those spoon bending. So I try to stay in it because that gives me the moments. It's like Keanu going, ah, looking like, you know, the pencil was an actual joke because I, I got so frustrated at the first stunt guys in the first John Wick because I wouldn't do it. I stabbed the guy with a pencil. <laughs> Wake up! And I was like, oh, that'd be cool. Let's stab a guy in the ear with a pencil. Um, <laughs> And it was just, like, seriously, moments of genius come that way. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm, I enjoy it. It's something I think. And again, uh, to my point, I want to live by example. I, you know, I go wardrobe shopping. Like, I'm supposed to be the big, tough stunt guy. I love shopping for wardrobe. I love going shopping. I've got the best wardrobe supervisor ever, and he's got me into the world of fashion and just understanding what that is. That's a big part of John Wick. Like those suits didn't just didn't oh, get yeah. invented. We tailored those. those were nice. And we went to Italy, we went to France, we went to Milan just to see what the new styles were and then took what we wanted out of that. Um, I don't see stunts any different than lighting. I'm a huge lighting freak. Um, composition or, or wardrobe. It's just another department that you have to be vested in. Thank you. Sure. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Magic. I, I'm a MFA filmmaking student. And, uh, I heard you before you you train you train with uh, Daniel Sandu, the yeah, legendary one of the for uh, all, martial yeah. artist. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, I also practice martial art. I practice kung fu. I practice Wing Chun. You, you must be know Wing Chun, yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> and uh, for the for in your movie in your movie uh, every every single movie you directed, I, I saw a lot of different fighting scenes. Mm -hmm. And so, how you give the different. Uh, uh, dramatic uh, of uh, choreography mm -hmm. arc and uh, and uh, and uh, how you give different uh, pacing for the to the different thing a uh, different scene a different f um, fighting scene. The, uh, what he's talking about, there's a guy named Dan Asano. He was a guy that coached Bruce Lee. Yeah, that's the yeah, yeah. come from. Um, back in the day when those guys were still still around and stuff, they believed in what now you guys know as cross training. In the day, you were a karate guy or something. This guy actually started probably the most famous martial art academy of the 20th century. It was in Los Angeles, Maria de Rey. That's the real reason I came to California, not to get away from the snow. 
Um, I lived with him, he became one of his instructors. I was paid for many years to travel around the world and learn martial arts, that was my gig. And then we'd work with cops or military or train other athletes to do it. So that's kind of what he's talking about. Just in that sense alone, you know, I'd spend six months in Japan at the Kodokan or, or learning Japanese swordsmanship. Then I'd come back with the Brazilians and learn the Jiu Jitsu stuff. Then I'd go to Thailand and work like that. That gives you a sense of, that eclectic sense of culture. And it also gives you, uh, in, in, a, in a weird way, the more you travel around the world, the more you, you see different things. Like, you know, you read the script. And if the script happens, okay, it's Jackie Chan in Las Vegas. Okay, well, yeah, you could do Wing Chun. You think. It depends on the character. And you can build the character on a martial art, or you can take the character. Usually, in the West, we do it a little differently than Asia. You can mm. find, you know, Jet Li in a Wushu Center. Yeah. And you can build movies and stuff, build a whole career on this guy. Like Michelle Yeoh, she was Miss Malaysia. And she ended up being, you know, she's a girl from Bond and Super Cop. And all that. Um, you know, in the West, like, when we met Hugh Jackman for Wolverine, he moves a certain way, so that would be this. When we met Statham, he's more of a slugger and a box, so he would be this. Stallone would be a wrestler. We, we, we have to design slightly differently mm -hmm. out here. So having all the different models, like, a good choreographer could take any one of you and make you John Wick in a week. <laughs> Maybe not to the extent, but, like, that's our job. Like, uh, in Asia, you would find a world champion wushu kung fu martial artist and then train them to act. We're, we're the opposite. We find the actors, and it's our job to get Charlize Theron or Angelina and Jolie to go. Like, women are always a chance. To me, I want to do a great female action movie. That would be, that's my career goal right now. <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, written by a woman, performed by a woman, done by a woman. We, we want to see it. That's, that's so, if any of you got scripts with a female character. <laughs> well, um, Atomic Blonde looks great. like it might be that. <laughs> it's close. It's still. Mm, we'll get to that. Um, we hope. I hope it does really well. It's my partner's movie. I hope it does really well. Uh, but you can't, like any woman here, I think, like if I did, say, just, I'm going to talk total nerd for a sec. If I took, say, any of our young ladies right here, okay, I'm probably not going to do Wushu. I'm not going to do Bakwa. I'm not going to do Wing Chun. I'm probably not. I have to make them believable to beat up a six foot tall. How many times have you ever seen a female star beat up a couple dudes and you bought it? Mm. Mm. It's hard to do. It's really hard. Maybe you get a little Angelina Jolie. Maybe you get Kit Scarlett Johansson. By the way, my wife Logan. is Scarlett Johansson stunt double, so that's my wife. Whoa. She's currently in Scotland on Avengers 3. <laughs> yeah, so she's great. Um, so if you see Scarlett move good, it's my wife. Um, <laughs> but that's tricky. That is probably the most difficult thing out there is to make a believable female action star good. But in Japanese, like you teach them how to hit to the throat or bend a finger, like you choreograph around them to give it character. And through that and the cast member, how you develop that style and how, you, how they hold the gun or what gun you choose. If I give one of these girls like an M60 that's this big, you're probably not going to believe it. <laughs> I give them this little Walter PPK and I make them do everything really covert, you're probably going to believe it. So that's the magic of taking a martial art and matching it to a character. Or making a new character like John Wick or something like that. Cool. Uh, and I also saw the 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 mirror scene, the mirror mm -hmm. scene. So I I I can I can feel you. You pay a tribute to to the Into the Dragon, Into the Dragon. I Bruce tried. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I but tried. but but your camera move is more. You know, actually, is more hard, I more had, difficult than than yeah, the Yeah, I had Inter more money, and I had some visual effects help that probably oh. Robert, Robert Klaus didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't remove it digitally back then. Yeah, you know? back then they had to be. They didn't have the resources I had, so <laughs> okay. I can't take full credit. Okay, thank you. Then. You're welcome. I would love to see you try to turn me into John Wick in one week, though. Sometimes two. <laughs> two, uh, <laughs> two. No, years, guar no guarantees. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. And uh, my name is Loon. I'm an action movie actor. And so what I want to ask you are all about and just about action movie. Mm -hmm. And the first, uh, my first question is, how, uh, how did you avoid injury as a stunt performer? And my second question is, how do you protect other stand guy as a uh, stand coordinator or director? Mm -hmm. um, just to paint the picture of the world, it's gotten, um, when I started, it was probably 100% better than the 10 years before that I started. Now it's probably 200% better than when I started. To answer your first question, I didn't. Um, to date, I have 13 surgeries under my belt. Um, I've had over a thousand stitches, uh, broken my back, my neck, both arms, both shoulders, both knees, ankle, and uh, my hip. <laughs> my face has been reconstructed twice. Um, on the first matrix, I broke everything in my right side. Um, so I didn't, so that's the answer to that one. Uh, <laughs> 
I got bitten by a dog once. There's, uh, <laughs> that's why you see, like, I don't sit still, and that's because things start hurting. Um, but that's, again, I was in the top 5% of stunt doubles at the time. I was actively performing nearly every day or every other day on high-end martial art shows. And at the time, uh, you know what we guys, when we call rigging or wire work? Before wire removal, they did it on piano wire. So the stunt guys were very small, very light. They had to be, otherwise a piano operator. Um, when you're figuring and you're doing high-end ratchets or what we call wire work, or when you see a guy gets yanked back or they fly, that's wire work. At the time, the systems weren't quite developed. So you kind of had a better than average chance of coming out okay. But when you're doing from there about 80 feet in the air and 200 feet that way, doesn't always work out well. Sometimes the math is a little off. Okay. Nowadays, it's gotten to the point where uh, when I started, maybe there were three or four deaths a year. And it's usually, it all goes back to human error. Or people just being really either ignorant or just fucking dumb. Um, someone should have said, this isn't a great idea. Or they didn't rehearse it properly. You know, it, doing a rehearsal in a gym is one thing. Doing it out on location with explosions, with stuff. And every, all the factors are different. And it's, it, you know, I was on the side of the crow. I was on the side of the expendables. I've witnessed two fatalities. Um, and it's always down to the same thing. It's, let's hurry up and go. Don't worry, it's a lot of yes men going, oh, right, we got no time. If you'd had time, if they had had time, if they had like another three hours to go, no one would have said go. They all just said, yeah, this is dumb. But because you gotta go, we gotta go, let's go, we gotta go, we gotta go. And everybody goes, yeah, yeah, we gotta go. Yo, know, will it be okay? Yeah, it should be okay, let's go. And like, you get a bunch of, like a person is smart, people are dumb. You ever hear that expression? Like, you get a group of really smart people together, but they're all tired and they all gotta go and they wanna make it happen. That's when dumb decisions get made. And every time I can try, when, I, when I've been hurt, a lot of times it's me being like, I can, you know, I'm trying to go into ego, stunt guy. I'm a tough guy, I can do it. I should I had no business getting up on that thing. I should have tested the rig and done it. Man, we should have done three or four more tests. I'm like, no, we got it. Let's just go. I can do it. I can make it. And that's the next thing. My legs turned around backwards. And believe me, it's not like the movies, literally, where you get up and go, yeah, and you spit and you wipe the blood off. I cried and peed my pants, and then I went to the hospital. Um, so, yeah, that wasn't cool. <laughs> but it's so much better now. Nowadays, honestly, because my wife is still a performer, um, and I'm ultra protective of her and the stunt team she works with. Uh, most of the time it's just our stunting now, but the rigging capabilities, the safety precautions, the entire industry's come a long way. Like, you know, back in the 80s, to do two lines of coke, go party, coke and hookers, woo! Um, <laughs> that doesn't exist in the industry right now. Like, stuntmen are all professional athletes that are usually in bed by nine because of competition. If I told you right now, just be really good, listen to what I say, and you can make half a million dollars, you're probably gonna go to better, smart, smart ones will make it. <laughs> you know, we'll go to bed early, stop, they're not going to chase girls around, they're not going to do drugs, they're not going to drink, they're going to go work out in the gym. Like, it's a whole different attitude nowadays. It's very, very, very professional. And everybody's very, very into being safe. Because if there are the few accidents that do happen, trust me, it's, it's crushing. Crushing when it happens to the entire industry. Thank you so much. Sure. Actually, one thing I was going to jump in with, we had Hal Needham. Uh, speak mm -hmm. here many years ago. Yeah, Tony even directed Hooper. He directed Smokey and the Bandit. Several Hoopers. Uh, uh, several Smokey and yeah. the Bandits, yeah. And he was a famous stuntman as well before he became a director. And remember how much he said he hated effects in stunts. Like, he, he's an old school guy, of course. And there was a fledgling man. part of the industry back then. But now, right. again, even the, the special effects guys, where they used to be known as a little bit loose and yeehaw, and the stunt guys were yeehaw, and the stunt guy and the effects guys were like, well, eh, put more black powder in. Right, right. It's kind of changing now. Everyone's yeah. on the same page. And you, the whole level of people, I mean, you're talking about There's more you know, science MBAs and chemistry now. Yeah. You're talking about structural and, and uh, you know, physical engineers are taking over the business. It's, it's just the money involved now. Mm -hmm. And the lawsuits and like, you know, Marvel has a, you know, three billion dollar interest in their movies. Right. You know, like Warner Brothers and DC, like those are, you do not want somebody getting hurt. You yes. don't want anybody turning an ankle. Yes. You know, like these are franchises and dollar amounts to be protected. So yeah, they, everyone wants to, you know, they got the half a billion dollar insurance policy. Like you don't want anybody getting hurt. You want to hang now. So the medics, the thing, every, it's pretty pro. I mean, mm -hmm. our, the last couple of times we've been on set is incredibly... Incredibly well put together and incredibly safe, yeah. Yeah. Even you can do it. <laughs> With two weeks, right? <laughs> two weeks to wait. Hey, how you doing? Um, Good. I feel bad that I'm the last question. Um, 
I read somewhere there's going to be a TV adaptation of John Wick. There is, yes. Are you involved at all, and can you discuss it? Um, I've been asked to help creatively to develop. Uh, <laughs> good word to know is development. <laughs> <laughs> development can mean a lot of different things in life. Uh, but yeah, they are developing the TV show. Um, we're currently working on the script for John Wick 3, which I, uh, which we like. Thank you. Um, Keanu's a great guy to work with, so that's a good thing for that. The TV show is based on, you know, the Continental Hotel in that world. They've, I, either they've hired the writer that I think we all like, or they're in negotiations with them right now. I don't want to speak out of, out of school with that. Um, they've asked me to direct a pilot and to help supervise the development of it, and I'd like to stay involved in that, because it's partly our creation, so I feel like, I like the, uh, no, I like action movies, obviously, but I like John Wick. I love working with Keanu. If that's, if my career terminated with just doing five Keanu Reeves movies, I'd be pretty proud of that. He's a great, <laughs> great human being. Um, and the crew I have, it's a crew I've built over the last 15 years. The writers we know, uh, the studio that I work for now, as far as John Wick goes, they're all great people and they all believe in it, which is fun. I mean, because like, if you do have to spend 15 hours a day at a job, it's good to like the people you work with. Um, I think that's, at my age, that's probably the most important thing in my life is working on projects. Like you don't, I don't know if you guys know, but every project from development to by the time I do things like this, publicity, it's like two years of your life, you know, minimal. So be true to what you love and like, you know, make sure it's what you love because that's a lot of time away, you know, clock's ticking. Um, and the TV show is something, yeah, I said there's a couple other projects I'm going to direct and do in between, but um, yeah, I think it'd be fun. I think it'd be an interesting TV. And TV right now is, I think, off the charts. It's totally. so good right now and it's... I think it's an amazing way to storytell right now. And at the end of the day, I'm sure any of you that want to be in the industry, you like to tell stories. Because first and foremost, we're entertainers. Never forget that. Um, if you want to be a true grumpy curmudgeon artist, that's cool. You can paint your <laughs> pictures, but you're probably not going to get 10 million a picture. Um, so you do have to make things that other people. That's why I, I honestly, I read every review. I've read every review of John Wick 2, even the really shitty ones. I find it interesting. Because like, I, honestly, when we were making the John, John Wick thing, just like when we were doing the TV series is why I bring it up, um, we went to every fan base thing out there and just under assumed name just go, so what do you want to see? You know, uh, we do. Because I, I remember John Wick, I don't, he was very kind when he introduced me about, um, we did create it out of our own head. You know, um, I usually write the story first and then give it to the writers to do the script. I just go walk around the cities I want to shoot in and I get ideas. You walk around New York, I got the whole idea for Lawrence, I walk, there's so many homeless people in New York and I end up having conversations with a bunch of them. And they, one guy hit it on the head, he just felt like, he's like, dude, it ain't that bad. I can blend in anywhere, I can do anything I want and no one pays attention to me. He's like, I walk through banquets, balls, parades, no one ever wants to talk to me or even mess with me. Even the I was like, you're in the movie, dude. <laughs> I stayed at a place right on uh, Broad Street, right by Wall Street, and it was the first kosher sushi restaurant in Manhattan. And I walked in for the first night, and everybody in it was a Hasidic Jew. <laughs> and me and Ken looked at each other like, ooh, well, I don't know if we should sit down. And the guys came over, sat us down, and we ended up eating dinner there once a week for the whole time we were in the first John Wick. <laughs> and I, at the end, we were joking with them, like, no matter what I do. And they, they're all, bank everyone to the, to the guy was a banker. I thought it was amazing. And we're like, we're putting you guys in the next movie. It's just <laughs> and that's kind of how you get it. So you want to experience that stuff. You want to go. And um, that's what's interesting about it. So I, does that answer your question? Like, I, we're going to do a TV show, and I want to do it because it's fun, and we can create the world. And that's just... Uh, you answered it in some change. Cheers. Good. All right, right on. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, talk about uh, two inventions that were like the first John Wick, which I love so much, is the guy with the hat that comes with the crew and they take David all... David Patrick Kelly, Charlie. They yeah. take all the bodies Sanitation. away. Oh, yeah. that was like... Dinner so reservation. Dinner, right, yeah. right, right. He's great. I work with David Patrick. I did The Crow. I was Brandon Double on The Crow. Mm -hmm. And David was in The Crow. He was the lead bad guy. Oh, right, right, Crow. with the long hair. Yeah. yeah. So he came and we were looking for a guy to play the Undertaker guy and David walked into the auditions and I'm like, David. And he's like, Chad. I'm like, hey. He's like, you're the director? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you still want to audition? He's like, yeah. <laughs> Um, so hired No, us. but that, that uh, you we know, like the that. story of it, the conceivement of that, you know, it's just it's, it's something that I haven't seen in movies honestly, before. Honestly, it, it, when you, because the industry is not really based in L.A. anymore, unfortunately, um, you're always on location. So I yeah. spent about, literally, this last year is the longest I've spent at home in 10 years. Wow. Um, I spent as much as 11 months away. So you're always in hotels. So a lot of the ideas come yes. from... Oh God! I wish they would just deliver food to my room. If I was, oh God! I just wish I'd had the gym in the gym. Like, yes. A lot of it was based on, 
And we always thought, well, we were at this one place, I was staying in Sri Lanka. And everything was really, and it had the creepiest concierge ever. Because every time you call down and ask for something, he thought I meant like a woman. Like, you want special for, no, dude, I want a hamburger. A hamburger? I'm like, no, like an actual fucking hamburger. You know, it's like hamburger. I'm like, no. Dude. And then you said to your uh, wife, I'm sorry, I really right. just wanted chicken nuggets. Exactly, it's just like, I don't I know, know why there's two is. girls banging on my door right now. I just wanted a glass of water. <laughs> um, so we kind of took that, we'll, we'll speak in code, we'll say, look, yeah. if John Wick wants to make a dinner reservation, we'll have him just count out six coins and that'll be six bodies. And so we took all these ideas and kind of just twisted them a little bit. Yeah, and, and the whole all... continental thing, the hotel yeah. and yeah. the whole lounge. The world building, that was terrific. That was Thanks. really... Thanks, uh, again, very... based on Greek mythology and a, a shitload of time in hotels. <laughs> um, the combination. Right, right, right. I, really, I wish I had some genius like insight into how we came up with it, but it was just like we tried to make... Dave and I tried to make a movie that was fun. We just wanted an action movie where everyone's in on the joke, but the people in the movie. Mm -hmm. Like when you start a movie, like everybody saw Buster Keaton in there. Okay, that's from Sherlock Jr. Oh my God. Which mm -hmm. is yeah, one of the right. best, I think, all time stunts. Like those guys who actually did the stuff like that. That's a cutie. You get like in the first movie, everybody wore red shirts that got shot. You guys got that from Star Trek. Mm. Okay, right. right. Okay. There's a lot of gags in this one that you see in other action movies, and we just wanted to like want you to know from the first frame to the last frame that. You know, it's a fun movie, and hopefully you got, like, anybody does classical music here? Okay, did you pick out Hayden? Did you get Vivaldi? Vivaldi at the end. Vivaldi at the end, we took out the percussion and actually choreographed the entire fight to add percussion into Vivaldi summer with the gunshots. No one will probably ever get that, <laughs> but that's my little artistic tribute to action movies. Beside all the fantastic buildings in this one, really, I mean, Rome and the museums mm. and, you know, um, in New York and um, the whole stuff in Italy. It was visually really, really stunning and um, an incredible fodder for the action, the kinetic action. They call it the wrapping. You can do cool action, but it's always cooler to see cool action against a cool. Yes. Um, I'm a big fan of the old Bonds. And the first time I saw like uh, Sean Connery and St. Moritz doing the luge chase, I just mm -hmm. I just knew I want to go to Austria, I want to go to Switzerland, I want to. Yeah. So hopefully you guys saw something. This like, does that museum really exist? Does this really exist? Does this really go? I want to go to Rome. I, we want you to see stuff. You know, no, times you get pissed incredible. off, you watch a movie that happens in like St. Moritz, and you see like a lens like that, you don't see anything. Mm -hmm. Like, I want you to, like, next time you walk into a museum, go, yeah, I could do a gunfight in here. <laughs> <laughs> you walk into the pass system under the Freedom Tower. Like, we're the first movie that shot under the Freedom Tower. That's where that yeah. whole yeah. train sequence happened. And we only did that, honestly. We walked in, they were still building it. And everyone said, don't ask, because the MTA is going to shut you down. It's like, a, what we didn't know is the train runs between Jersey and New York, so it became a Jersey jurisdiction. <laughs> mm -hmm. And New Jersey was like, you can shoot wherever you want. <laughs> And like with guns, they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> we'll supply the guns. Right. And those catacombs are actually directly under, when you saw the rock concert, mm -hmm. that's one location, it's called Caracalla Baths. It's a 2000, so the oldest, it's older than the Colosseum in Rome. It's their number one attraction. The catacombs are directly underneath it. So it's actually one location. Like when he goes into that hole, that actually drops into that, like it's the coolest, wow. we were like, oh my God. So I saw it my first time I scouted Rome going, oh, this is great, we gotta find a place just like this. And the more I thought about it, I was like, why don't we just ask the lady over there? Maybe she'll let us. And like, dude, it's the biggest, you know, attraction in Rome. There's no yeah. way. I was like, hey, would you mind if, could we shoot here? It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, no, no, what I mean shoot is I'm going to have 50 stunt guys down here with automatic weapons. We're going to shoot stunt guys. It's like, oh, yeah. She taps her on. She goes, oh, yeah, it's been around 2,000 years. You guys don't hurt it. <laughs> I'm like, oh. And that's how we ended up shooting them. So never... Never be shy to ask wow. or, or beg, I beg. Right. And I think I was arrested twice in New York <laughs> for breaking permit things. But and let luckily my producers, two filmmakers, yeah. get your permits in order. Yeah, get your permits in order. Don't ever trust the right. wine producer. <laughs> um, well, yeah. um, I want to thank you so much on behalf of the students. Sure. We learned a lot from you. The way you were talking about integrating the story and the stunt together, that was very important and I think interesting for us to learn. And it was fun. And Good. thank you for Good. coming. And thank really. you. All. Yeah. Thank you.